Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In today's episode, we will talk about the happiness curriculum classes started by the Delhi government, which the US First Lady Melania Trump is scheduled to visit. We will also talk about United States becoming India's top trading partner. But first, we talk about the sedition law. On Thursday, a protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act had taken place at the Freedom Park in Bengaluru. The protest had been attended by AIMIM chief and Hyderabad MP Asasuddin OAC. During the protest, something unexpected happened. A 19-year-old student of a South Bengaluru college took to stage and raised slogans saying Pakistan Zindabad. Almost immediately, the organizers tried to take the mic away from her, but she continued. Though now, she said Hindustan Zindabad. Some people did chant along to the Hindustan Zindabad, but then the microphone was taken away from her. There was a commotion, but she still continued to speak. She said something like the difference between Pakistan Zindabad and Hindustan Zindabad. But before she could finish, she was stopped, forced down the stage and was later arrested. This was Amulya Leona, a student activist who had been taking part in several other anti-CA protests across the state. Soon after the incident, Asasuddin OAC condemned her statement and said that neither him nor his party have any connection with this. मैं इसको कंडेम करता हूं और ये लोग पागल हैं इनको देश से कोई मोहब्बत है ना ही इनको करना है जाकर और जा करें यहां क्यों आए व्हेन इंडियन एक्सप्रेस गॉट इन टच विद अ फ्रेंड ऑफ हर्स द पर्सन पॉइंटेड टू हर फेसबुक पोस्ट फ्रॉम फेब्रुअरी 16th वेयर अमूल्या सेड जिंदाबाद फॉर अबाउट 7 एशियन कंट्रीज इंक्लूडिंग इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान एंड रोट एंड आई कोट आई डू नॉट बिकम अ पर्सन फ्रॉम अनदर कंट्री बाय मेरली सेइंग जिंदाबाद अबाउट दैट कंट्री as per law i am an indian citizen it is my duty to respect my country and work for its citizens in fact according to the report by our karnataka correspondent jonathan ta amulya had also written in response to west bengal chief dilip ghosh back in 2016 when he had said that those shouting slogans like pakistan zindabad would be beheaded chala ke pakistan zindabad bolbe tare upar theke chonchi uri la hobe sapun niche In a social media post back then Amulya had said that I believe in ultimate brotherhood I believe in the collective sense of universal being these borders mean nothing to me after a point but now the Bangalore police has filed a case of sedition against her and has sent her to judicial custody for 14 days in this segment Apurva Vishwanath joins us to talk about why her pro Pakistan slogan is being treated as sedition what the law says about it and why judging something as sedition can be very tricky apurva we are talking about the slogans that were chanted by the student activist amulya leona where she said pakistan zindabad now while her statements may seem controversial why is she booked for sedition because of them how and why is someone booked for sedition So Amulya's case is interesting because it is identical to a landmark supreme court judgment on sedition in the Balwant Singh case it is exactly the set of facts that you had two government employees in the peak of militancy in Punjab you know sloganeering and saying raj karega khalsa and khalistan zindabad and this case eventually goes up to the supreme court and the supreme court holds that mere sloganeering is not sedition you can compare you know amulya saying pakistan zindabad to that case and you will find that it is not seditious so that's why it's important to understand what is sedition and what is not and uh, the provision itself says it's worded a little complicatedly it says whoever by words either spoken or written or by signs or by visible representation or otherwise it could be words written or spoken or by you know signs which is why sometimes you see somebody holding a placard and they charge for sedition or uh, in the case of arundhati roy she wrote an article which the state claimed was in support of the naxal movement 
So she was charged with sedition, either by word spoken or written or by signs, brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government established by law in India. So this word, which is very important, is excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government of India. So how do you define disaffection is a huge, huge question. And the provision itself tries to explain that a little bit, but I think it further pushes that into more vague definitions. The explanation is, it says, the expression disaffection includes disloyalty and all feelings of enmity. I mean, if you understand, this is a thought crime. You're saying includes disloyalty or all feelings of enmity. So it is eventually left for the stakeholders, which is the state in this case, and also sometimes the judiciary, to really determine what is disaffection, whether that is disloyalty or feelings of enmity towards the state. So the easiest way for a IO in a, an inspector in a police station uh, to define feelings of enmity is when he hears the slogan, Pakistan Zandaba. So that's how you would have a case like Amulya's become a case of 124A of the IPC. So when we're talking about, you know, feelings of enmity and disloyalty, how close does it get to say, you know, when somebody wants to express criticism of somebody of the government in power and wants to express any kind of dissent? Two things here. And again, the provision itself says that the provision itself has two more explanations where it clearly says, commence expressing disappropriation of the administrative or other action of the government without exciting or attempting to excite hatred, contempt, disaffection do not constitute an offense under this section. So it says you can criticize the government, you can criticize the measures of the government with a view to alter them, but you cannot do it by exciting hatred, contempt, or disaffection. So these three terms are obviously very vague and confusing. So in 1962, uh, when the sedition law itself was challenged in Kedar Nath Singh case in the Supreme Court, so the Supreme Court, what it does is it upheld the law but it did read the provision very restrictively. The court said, fine, we think sedition should continue to be a crime, but we will you know, tell you basically when you can convict somebody for sedition. So in this case, on the face of it, at least it feels like disaffection, hatred and contempt are really subjective and you really don't know how to fit these things because you do have a fundamental right of freedom and expression. So if you have to curb that, if you have to curb free speech, there is only one way constitutionally. And that is if that speech falls under any of the categories that is listed in Article 19, Clause 2, which is a very exhaustive list. So the court finds one item in that list, which is public disorder. The court says only when, in case your speech or your you know written word can incite people to create public disorder. That's when it's sedition. So it doesn't have to cause public disorder one just has to perceive that it may cause public disorder. Yes. Whether it immediately causes or not is a different issue. If the state perceives that it could cause public disorder and the state brings some evidence to that fact, like, for example, you could argue that in the CAA protest, which is what the state is you know, doing in so many cases, that these protesters saying this will lead to public disorder. Although the standard of public disorder is something, is public disorder blocking a road? Yes, it is sometimes. Is public disorder bringing down the government? Could be. Is public disorder, you know, a mob unleashed on the city? Could be. So when it is so vague, speech that the state says is causing public disorder, it sits very uneasily. And that's what makes it so easy for the state to invoke this provision against anybody at will. You know, in the recent past, we've seen a number of sedition cases in the cases of, you know, protests against the Anti-Citizenship Amendment Act. We have seen, you know, the case in Jharkhand where 10,000 people were charged with sedition for, you know, a case where they had basically engraved a part of the constitution on the stone. And I was wondering, you know, in all these cases, how much does interpretation of this law, which can be subjective, lies with, you know, the police and the lower court sort of having their own interpretation of this. So interestingly, to understand this, let's just look at one piece of statistic, which is basically that the number of sedition cases filed from 2015 to 2019, which is four years, right? 
191. This is the uh, latest CRB data. And of the 191 cases, only four ended up in convictions. Just four. So in four years, you had four cases which resulted in conviction. So trial was completed in about 43 cases. But uh, 2018 saw a conviction rate about 5.4%. 2016, it was about 16.7%. And in 2017, it was about 33%. So if you look at why there isn't a conviction, you will see that either the charges against the accused are being dropped or there have been acquittals, which means there is some sort of gap between what the state perceives to be sedition and what the courts eventually hold. But like we always say when it comes to criminal jurisprudence, the process is the punishment. So when somebody is booked under sedition, it is a non bailable non-cognizable offense, which means you can be arrested without a warrant. A policeman can knock on your door and arrest you. And it is non-bailable, which means you automatically don't get bail. A judge has to grant you bail, a district judge, or the high court has to grant you bail specifically, which when the state opposes becomes very difficult. So there is some dissonance in what the state perceives something to be sedition and what the uh, courts eventually hold which is why the role of a judicial magistrate becomes very important in ascertaining whether something is seditious or not. So the magistrate is the first point of contact in the judicial system who looks at the FIR, who looks at the case diary and has to be satisfied that this warrants arrest. The person must be arrested. And in granting arrest, like I mentioned in the story, the gravity of the offense is not the only thing that the magistrate should consider. The magistrate should consider things like whether a person is likely to abscond, whether he will be available for trial, whether he has a criminal antecedent, past antecedent. There's so many of the things, except, but what we are seeing, at least in the sedition cases that have been filed since December last year, which is in the wake of the CA protests, is that the magistrates have in every case ordered arrest without fail. In every arrest that has been made, the magistrate has allowed custody. So that becomes a very tricky situation. And here is where you you need the magistrate to sort of show some application of mind, see whether something constitutes sedition or not, and then act accordingly. Next, we talk about happiness classes. On a first visit to India that starts today, along with US President Donald Trump, the first lady, Melania Trump, is scheduled to visit a Delhi government school. During the visit, she will attend a happiness curriculum class. The curriculum has been one of the flagship schemes of the Delhi government in the education sector and was launched in July 2018 in all government schools. In this segment, Malika Joshi explains what a happiness class involves and the response it has seen from students and parents. Malika, could you talk about how did this idea of a happiness curriculum come about? So, you know, in Delhi and across the country, actually, the governments, the CBSC, everyone has tried to reduce stress levels among students for a long time. When our government came into power in 2015, they also looked into this initially, but the final structure of the program was created in 2018. Before that, the government had a series of discussions with officials in the department, with experts on uh, outside the government, to figure out how discussion, the, the spirit of discussion, the spirit of sharing, the spirit of, spirit of storytelling, mindfulness, how all of these could be incorporated in a child's daily routine to make sure that the development of the child is not just based on learning a few chapters or doing a few mathematics sums. The idea behind the project was that. How are they managing to now implement it? What does a happiness class look like and what grades does it focus on? So uh, the happiness class is pan school. So it's only in Delhi government schools so far. So if your school starts from nursery. So children in nursery and KG have two happiness classes a week of 45 minutes each. So this includes basically play, talking, sharing stories. For classes above that, for the middle and the senior grades, there's one happiness class per day. That is also 45 minutes long. It's usually the first 45 minutes of the day where they sit with teachers. There's a very broad sort of a curriculum where, you know, there are stories that teachers tell or students read out or discuss. 
then students also discuss their own experiences they practice mindfulness a bit of meditation all of these things then there is also you know at least once or twice a, a month students will talk about how you know the the way the curriculum could change what they want more from it so it's it's a very fluid sort of a curriculum do we know about any other countries that have tried similar programs we are not aware of any other country who that has tried a program of this sort in an institutionalized manner but uh, meditation and mindfulness have been part of some schools curriculum but as i said not in an institutionalized manner but since aam aadmi party government in delhi started in their schools a lot of other states have shown interest so you have telangana saying that we perhaps would like to see what your program is a lot of people from other countries have actually shown interest so there's a school in uh, new york which has similar classes after they saw it on government school teachers twitter so they got in touch with the teacher in delhi and they started a similar class in their school so yes it has gained a lot of popularity after the program was started in delhi what kind of response have we seen from children and the parents what have been their reactions so uh, a lot of children have you know for them it's also a place where they can unwind and they can share any interesting things that are happening in their lives or in their homes or in the classroom itself or in the school they also get to share problems with the teachers so one of the core aspects of the happiness curriculum is that the teacher is not this is not a class where you're supposed to teach anything it is a, it is extremely interactive in its uh, form so uh, what a lot of teachers as well as parents say that the kids have become very confident since this started because now they know how to address a class for example they know how to speak in public they also you know if they share problems then other other uh, children will come and they will tell them uh, that you know perhaps we also say face similar problems so they also identify more with their classmates because of this curriculum they also then a lot of children actually go back home and uh, they will teach their siblings or sometimes their parents to meditate so those are the kind of impact that is the kind of impact we've seen in the first two first one 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 and a half year of the implementation so we're talking when you know the first lady of the united states melania trump she is scheduled to visit one of these classes and earlier the delhi chief minister arvind kejriwal and deputy chief minister manish sisodia were expected to accompany her and then we saw reports that that decision was turned do we know why that decision was turned and if the aap government has said anything about it so the aap government has not on record said anything about uh, the decision to not have the cm and the deputy cm in the welcome party at the school but uh, what we have learned is that the us embassy told them that they were not too keen on politicizing the event some aap leaders have also indicated that this happened under pressure from the center but the aap government has not said anything along these lines on record so far and the the visit to the school is on that has not been cancelled so far and in the end we talk about us and india relations the united states has now become india's top trading partner surpassing china according to 2018-19 data from the commerce ministry the bilateral trade between us and india amounted to 87.95 billion us dollars trade experts say a free trade agreement between the two nations would take the economic ties to a whole new level it is worth noting that america is one of the few countries with which india has a trade surplus while dealing with the us India had a surplus of 16.85 billion in the year 2018 to 19 alone. It is in the backdrop of a global economic slowdown that President Trump commences his visit to India today. It will be his first visit to India as the US president. Although a trade deal is not on the table, Trump has emphasized on talking trade during his visit. Well, we can have a trade deal with India, but I'm really saving the big deal for later on. We're doing a very big trade deal with India. We'll have it. I don't know if it'll be done before the election, but we'll have a very big deal with India. Uh, we're not treated very well by India, but I happen to like Prime Minister Modi a lot. Today, President Trump and the First Lady are scheduled to arrive in Ahmedabad in the morning and visit the Sabarmati Gandhi Ashram. After which, Trump, along with Prime Minister Modi, will address the Namaste Trump event. Trump and Melania will then leave for Agra and visit the Taj Mahal.
following which they will proceed to New Delhi. Tomorrow, Trump will meet PM Modi in the capital, sign various agreements, memorandum of understandings and give out a press statement. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show, as always, was edited and mixed by our producer, Joshua Thomas. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcasts at the rate indianexpress.com.